Susan, it's a great pleasure to be talking with you today. Likewise. Thank you for coming to Washington. Thank it's, you. It's, it's, it's good to have you here. What brought you to the point that you felt you had to write this book? Well, I wanted to try and understand what happened to us as a nation after 9-11 because uh, when you go back and you look at, at um, the months after 9-11, look at our cultural response, you notice something really strange. It's not as if we were, uh, in so many ways, we were not reacting to the actual threat. We seemed uh, to fall into some kind of strange fever dream where our politicians and our pundits uh, were talking about uh, how this was uh, back to the days of the frontier, uh, and back to the, our Indian Wars. These were actual terms that were used in uh, mainstream publications. And of course, we had the White House um, uh, spouting vigilante rhetoric about, you know, smoke them out of their holes and wanted dead or alive. Uh, John Wayne kept coming up. Uh, the media was talking about the return of, of manly men and the return of uh, traditional family arrangements, claims that women uh, uh, scared, you know, security mom homemakers wanted to be protected and that men would be defending their homes. Uh, and yet, here we have been attacked by men who aimed the planes at the symbols of commercial and military power, uh -huh. uh, yet we were reacting as if this were an attack on the home and hearth. And I set out to try and understand how what? we got into this uh, mysterious uh, response. Uh -huh. Well, I, I think I've, I've read somewhere, I believe that your inspiration actually began with a moment in which you were in London during the 2005 bombings, and you noted the difference in the way the English reacted to that harrowing moment and the way we as a country did. Tell us about that. I was in, I was in Europe, I was actually in Stockholm, and uh, I, I was looking at the British press uh, and uh, you know listening to BBC, and it occurred to me that there were uh, and, and no such trend stories about how um, you know seven seven was going to put hair on uh, the British man's chest or uh -huh. um, return women to baking scones. Uh, it was all about this is a criminal matter that needs to be sort of methodically and and very practically pursued and prosecuted. Um, yet back here, uh, this, the papers were and and the talk shows were full of talk about. Uh, women, re how women would react to 9-11 by uh, uh, rushing to the wedding altar. Uh, the New York Times had four stories uh, claiming this in the first two months alone. How uh, women were uh, going to uh, set off a, a baby boom. Uh, how women were going to be baking cookies and, and uh, according to Time Magazine, stocking up on meatloaf pans and um, sewing machines. Uh, and again, where is that coming from? Uh -huh. that, uh, and it's it, even more ironic when you consider that we were attacked by uh, men who hate Western women's liberation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, you describe at the very start of your book an incident in which five panicked teenage girls visit a hospital in a major metropolitan city just after the events of 9-11. Um, actually, your book says in New it was in New York, but I believe it was in Boston. Uh, the girls were literally starving and they were unable to swallow. And they believed that they had human remains lodged in their throats. Right. And then you equate that gagged feeling with uh, the silence and the constricted voices of women after the Al-Qaeda bombings. Um, and tell us how that evolved for you. Well, you know, on, on the, that image resonates on several levels. Um, first of all, on the level of, of women being silenced. After 9-11, uh, there was an alarming decline in the number of women on uh, female bylines on op-ed pages, um, women uh, guests on talk shows. Uh, the White House Project had been monitoring this, those important Sunday morning news talk programs when 9-11 happened, and they noted that in the first seven weeks, after the attacks, uh, the, the number of female guests on those Sunday talk shows dropped by 40 percent. And regardless of whether it was the subject was terrorism or not, and even women who you think should have been on those shows, um, for example, Senators Feinstein and Boxer, who were uh, heading up committees, uh, subcommittees in Congress that were dealing with terrorism, made no appearances. 
Um, at the same time, there were all these uh, uh, women, particularly feminist-minded women, um, from Casa Pollitt at The Nation to Barbara Kingsolver, the novelist, to um, most famously Susan Sontag, who wrote a very small uh, short piece uh, in The New Yorker, who uh, were just uh, vilified for m what were actually rather mild, um, for them, very mild criticisms. So Susan Sontag suggested we might have a few shreds of historical awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara Kingsolver said perhaps a capacity for mercy might, might be something we could consider. And for that, they were called, well, well men um, who dissented were also criticized, not in the sort of moral and personal ways that, that women were gone after. They were called morally deranged idiots. Uh, uh, Katha Pollitt was called a bad mother. Uh, they were called traitors. Um, Barbara Kingsolver uh, found um, people sent her book back calling her, you know, uh, um, a sellout and uh, the, her alma mater tried to take away an honorary degree. It was. Uh, you, you saw this this kind of behavior um, across um, across the map in after 9/11. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to organize this interview in the way that you organize the book. You you divide your book into two sections. You call it uh, the first section ontogeny, and the second section phylogeny. And ontogeny means the life cycle experience of one particular organism, which is to say that the 20th century Americans experienced that moment of that attack on homeland soil. That was the moment, the ontogeny of, of the case. And the phylogeny, which means the lines of descent or the evolution, uh, the development of a species, which is to say that where we have come from, where we actually got the ammunition or the history or the mythology to reach right. that point uh, of the ontogeny. Um, Tell us why you chose to divide the, your book in that way. Other than <laughs> insisting on using yeah. uh, words that <laughs> few people have I mean, heard. Biological, right. yeah. Uh, well, I, the, the, the thesis that ontogeny uh, recapitulates phylogeny is one that is uh, discredited in the botanical world, but I thought it had uh, merit in uh, the, in the field of cultural history, because what I I think we were seeing in the months after 9-11 was a sort of quick time uh, recapitulation of the creation of our, the sort of reinstatement of our reigning cultural mythology, a mythology that took many, many years, you know, hundreds of years to evolve, that we, uh, after 9-11, um, f feeling vulnerable, feeling uh, traumatized, feeling fear, and feeling mm -hmm. humiliated, um, we as a culture reached for uh, the our security myth, mm -hmm. our sense of our ourselves as triumphal, as invincible, as um, as and uh, it's, a, it's a security myth that's personified by the male rescuing hero, protecting. Uh, the, the helpless and grateful woman uh, cowering in the homestead. Mm -hmm. So, right, starting with the ontogeny, um, when we experience that moment of the billowing smoke and the, and the burning buildings, um, you see it that 9-11 really caught us off guard and we were bumbling, as you say, we were uh, scrambling to make sense of it and you were, we were sort of li living a deluded dream that we had always been safe and that our country had been inviolable. Um, and then when the assault happened, when the plane struck, we scrambled, as you say, to make sense of it, and um, we were actually victims. But we wanted to frame the whole thing as heroes. Right. Uh, how do you explain that? Well, you know, after 9-11, we kept hearing over and over, this is something that has never happened to us before, that uh, America is not a place that's vulnerable to assault on home soil. And in recent times, that's true. But if you go back and you look at our earliest history, you see something very important. This has happened to us before, over and over, and its happening uh, was essential to the formation of the American character.
And by that I mean for the first to at least 200 years of our early, uh, our colonial and early American life, the prevailing reality was um, being attacked on quote unquote home soil. Now, needless to say, this is home soil that um, white settlers took from the native population. Um, but from the settlers' point of view, that whole period between you know the 17th century leading up into the uh, early part of the 18th century, um, what settlers experienced was again and again being attacked by people they demonized as non-Christian, non-white terrorists, the term that uh, was actually used. And these attacks uh, were not only traumatic, they were humiliating because over and over again, leaders, militias, husbands were not able to protect uh, families in frontier towns. Uh, by one estimate, between the late 17th and early 18th century, more than a quarter of women in New England uh, who were taken captive were never rescued, and a whopping 60 percent of girls were never rescued. On top of that, uh, uh, th one-third of women who were taken captive chose not to come home. They preferred Indian life. So you had all these gender reversals going on and a, and a sort of widespread uh, prevailing sense of insecurity and shame, mm -hmm. uh, what frontier historian Richard Slotkin uh, called an atmosphere of terror. And that was the, that was the prevailing climate of that period. So the question becomes, how did we respond to that? Well, we responded essentially by covering it up with the creation over many, many years of a cultural myth that um, supplanted our, our fears and humiliations with this triumphal um, uh, narrative, much of it fictional, um, in which we prevailed uh, you know, as the heroic cowboys on the Great Plains. Right. The Flight 93, for instance, which um, uh, in which these sort of, I guess, has been athletes. They were burly guys, but they uh, they were, after all, victims on that plane. But they were made out to be by the media. You say um, heroic figures. Um, Tell us a little bit about Flight 93 and how you see it. Well, you know, after 9-11, there was this desperate hunt for heroes. I mean, if you go back and you, you read the, the news transcripts and the newspapers and magazines over and over again, I mean, immediately uh, there was this sort of declaration, we, uh, the heroes, uh, there are going to be uh, manifold and there are going to be a million hero stories. And the, but the nature of the attack, uh, which was catastrophic, uh, prevented that story from unfolding the way that everyone craved. Uh, you know, in the Twin Towers, 95 percent of the people who died were above the fire line, were unreachable. Um, and the people below the fire line, you know, with the exception of um, people in, you know, a few people in wheelchairs or who were infirm, walked out on their own two feet. On top of that, the casualties um, of 9-11 were three to one male to female. So we had, uh, much like our, the early years of, of our history, here we are again in a, a situation where the myth we can't seem to enact the mythology we want to believe in. And certainly in, in the plains where everyone died, there, there, there were no uh, effective rescuers. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing that's striking about uh, Flight 93 is that uh, when the sort of hero story was imposed upon this this tale, uh, it had a, a very clear gender aspect. Let's roll. I remember exactly. It Todd was Beamer quoted by the pre president as, as well. And uh, for for a while there, um, Todd Beamer was listed as one of the most admired uh, uh, men in America. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and I don't mean to cast any aspersions on any of these people. In, in the, um, I'm sure everybody was courageous. Everyone uh, was, um, you know, did the best they could in a, in a completely terrible situation. Uh, but what was notable was the way that the media uh, told the story. There, uh, there were flight attendants who uh, called home to say they were boiling hot water to, and were part of the to campaign the, uh, to, 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 to fight back. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a flight attendant who uh, was actually um, skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
Uh, and those stories were put, for the most part, um, shoved aside to tell the story of, you know, the, the, the three or four burly men based only on the fact that they played sports. Uh -huh. So you really see, uh, in a way, the media as a kind of, if not villain, a, a kind of uh, marionettist behind the scenes staging this whole drama. Um, and they were monolithic. The media was monolithic in this because, as you say, uh, in, in the first six months of 2002, which is a striking figure, more than 75% of all Sunday talk shows featured no female guests. Not one. Um, now, there was, of course, a lot of um, a lot of random blogging that was being done. There was a mensaction.com, which called the Ground Zero smoldering vagina, and sort of uh, so the, the the whole aspect of womanhood was um, was made to look uh, like a victim, and mm -hmm. then men were, as you say, by the media really made to look like heroes, even when they were not, even when they were helpless, as mm -hmm. were the firefighters. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the firefighters. Well, here the firefighters uh, were, were essentially asked to settle for hero worship in the place of the protection and tools they desperately needed and had been begging for to, to do their jobs. Okay. Um, they had been pleading for working radios uh, since the 1993 bombing of the uh, World Trade Center sh uh, showed beyond a doubt that these radios did not work in high-rise buildings and particularly did not work in the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. um, the, the firefighters uh, did, did not view themselves the way the media uh -huh. wanted to present them. In the more than 500 oral history accounts that they gave to the New York City Fire Department, over and over again they talk about how they feel uh, felt victimized, uh, cheated, betrayed by the city leadership uh -huh. for failing to give them um, the safety equipment and the you know basic right. support and leadership that they they needed and mm -hmm. as one of the firefighters put it quite poignantly in, in his account he said the only difference between us and the victims were we had flashlights mm -hmm. and interestingly the city uh, tr uh, tried to quash these accounts it was more than three years and a lawsuit that went all the way up to the um, highest uh, state court before uh, the city was willing to release the real story of what, or the story of what the firefighters themselves said they experienced. Mm -hmm. The culture of feminism, mm -hmm. or the work of feminism, has be comes under a great uh, sort of criti critical scrutiny. Uh, not only scrutiny, but actual finger pointing. Mm -hmm. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. Yes, after 9-11, there was um, a disturbing number of articles and commentaries um, accusing women, specifically feminists, uh, of weakening our military, undermining our resolve to fight, uh, exhibiting traitorous behavior. Uh, feminism uh, was uh, blamed for uh, our, uh, our inability to prevail. Um, and and it was suggested that it, you know feminism more generally had uh, feminized the culture to such a degree that le it left us open to attack, to penetration from you know, the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had a, a bizarre encounter on the afternoon of 9/11, which I sort of wrote off at the time as just. The general, you know, um, uh, uh, unhingedness of people on that day. But I was uh, sitting at home, you know, watching TV like everyone else when the phone rang, and it was a reporter um, from Los Angeles who said he was working on a reaction story. Uh, and as it turned out, mostly he wanted to tell me his reaction, which was, he said, "Well, this sure pushes feminism off the map." Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I would have just, well, I did dismiss it, <laughs> but uh, in the weeks to follow, I got several more calls, um, not that extreme, but from reporters doing these, you know, supposed trend stories about how uh, one of them said 9-11 um, 
was going to make women more feminine, whatever that means. Uh -huh. um, another was doing a story about how women would want um, muscular, brawny men to protect Firemen. them. Firemen, uh -huh. yes, and there was the whole um, bogus trans story about uh, women lusting after firemen. Uh -huh. um, they became the hot dating commodity, right. as I remember. Right. So there was a lot of that silly stuff, but there was also this this serious side uh -huh. where women's voices were were silenced or um, uh, castigated, um, and were places where women, um, uh, feminists in particular, said, "Wait a second, uh, uh, why are we now referring to firefighters as firemen and police officers as policemen?" There were actually a lot of uh, first female. Uh, uh, female first responders uh, who rushed to ground zero, who behaved heroically. Right. Uh, and um, uh, now Legal Defense Fund actually did a very short film just looking at you know, a handful of women who had committed co courageous acts on that day. Uh, and they were soundly and fiercely denounced for it, um, particularly in the conservative media. Uh, and uh, and you could say swift voted it as well that uh, uh, now Legal Defense Fund was accused falsely of trying to take money away uh, from uh, the families of victims of 9-11 and use it to fund affirmative action uh, at, uh, in the rebuilding effort at, at, at uh, Ground Zero, which was completely false. Mm -hmm. Well. So even liberals were pushed to uh, the sort of the feminine cap. Um, the, I, you mentioned John O'Sullivan in the National Review, who accused feminists of of taking the side of um, of medieval Islamists against the common American enemy, and and right, he and never and, did explain what yeah. <laughs> what exactly he meant by and, that. And Jerry was, Falwell, who came out and mm. said, "You helped this happen right. to women." He right. said, um, uh, "You accused uh, pagans and abortionists and and mm. feminists all as a group as mm. as uh, causing this to happen." Right, the, and at the time. Um, you know, the, uh, his fellow travelers on the right said, oh, that's like, you know, that was a little too much. He was a little too direct. And they, they, but if you go um, back and look at, at the articles and commentary uh, after, you know, in the weeks after Falwell made that unfortunate statement, you see uh, more carefully phrased uh, uh, accusations that uh, go to the same point from Dobson, from from a, a whole slew of, of um, conservative pundits. Tell us a little bit about your view of Jessica Lynch. Right. I mean, Jessica, the story of or the made-up story of Jessica Lynch's rescue uh, has all the elements of our most fundamental myth. You know, the the sort of strong and inflated male heroes, the helpless woman in danger of rape. Uh, the, in the story we were told by the military uh, and then subsequently by the media uh, was that these special ops teams you know, raided this uh, Iraqi hospital after midnight and fought this uh, terrible battle with bloodthirsty Fedayeen death squads to rescue her. Uh, the reality was that uh, there, were, there was no battle. They were in and out in six minutes without a casualty. Uh, there were no Fedayeen death squads, as the military knew, because they had been informed by um, doctors in the, in the hospital. Um, it was just a bunch of doctors and nurses who were trying to take care of Lynch, and actually were trying to return her uh, to the military. Two days earlier, they had bundled her up in an ambulance and uh, tried driving her to uh, the U.S. Uh, where the U.S. forces were based, and they were actually donating their own blood to to actually help her, as I right. remember. Yeah. yeah, and they did all kinds. They gave her the one, the only bed they had that uh, could treat um, her particular injuries. Um, mm -hmm. They, you know, they, they took food out of their own homes, um, and they, they and then two days before they tried to return her. Uh, but had to turn around because they, uh, at a checkpoint, were uh, so fiercely shot at by U.S. military. Uh, and from the beginning, there was this insinuation, without any evidence, that she may have been raped. Um, and Jessica Lynch herself, who I interviewed for the book, says and maintains to this day, uh, I have no memory of being raped and uh, you know, doesn't believe that it happened.
Yet the story of the daring raid and the, the helpless girl is very important to us as a culture. And when you go back and you look at the descriptions of her in the media, uh, what you see over and over again is this um, story of of, uh, of, of uh, a systematic rewrite mm -hmm. of, of uh, a, a woman who was just doing her job, who had in, uh, enlisted not once but twice, turned into this um, sugar and spice little girl. The press um, went in droves to her hometown and, and seemed very eager to interview anybody who knew her um, you know, before she turned five. They were talking to her playmates, they were talking to her kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, they presented her as somebody who was uh, obsessed with wearing pink and was just this, as they put it, tiny little girl, doll-like, blonde waif, um, helpless, um, bad at bad at sports. Um, and when I talked to her, she said, you know, I, I didn't recognize myself in any of these descriptions. She said, I don't see myself as a passive girl, and I saw myself as a soldier doing a job. In fact, when the when the soldiers came in in this what you call staged scene, uh, they said, um, "We are American soldiers, and we are here to save you." Right. And she said, "I am an American soldier too." Mm -hmm. And it was also used in the weeks ahead. Um, there were quite a few commentaries and and discussion on talk shows, uh, news programs about. How well d didn't this indicate that maybe women shouldn't be, you know, so close to the lines of combat, and maybe this was going to start, um, uh, you know, a long-needed reevaluation of women's role in the military? Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, right away there was a sort of political uh, um, uh, reaction that, again, suggested uh, that women uh, return to a more traditional. Right. You know, in this whole uh, kind of jury-rigged hero and victim system, where the the heroes were actually male victims, uh, largely the firefighters, and then the victims um, uh, were designated as the 9/11 widows, and as long as they stuck to that sort of helpless homemaker role, they were you know fawned over in the media. Um, I mean, some of these poor widows had to you know, were asked. Uh, you know, more than a dozen times to make appearances and talk, basically to to talk about um, how uh, the the men they knew were heroic and that they and to sort of present themselves as vulnerable and helpless and apolitical. I mean, they if you look at the transcripts, they're asked over and over again. Now, do you um, how do you feel about do you, do you think the government will take care of you? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh -huh. um, I don't know anything about government. Uh, the, the media did repeated um, shows about uh, the widows who had babies, um, and it, it, this elaborate, um, you know, uh, 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 shows on you know bringing you know um, all these babies onto the set, and uh, and it was you know a display of that that was all fine, mm -hmm. but um, here are the Jersey girls who were the uh, so core group of about four women uh, who, you know, started out traditional suburban, uh, they're uh, dependent on um, their husbands who uh, worked in, in finance in the Twin Towers. And two of the four had voted for Bush in 2000, so these weren't, you know, raving radicals. Uh -huh. And what they came to after 9-11 was, you, as, as one of them said, I, um, I can't, uh, sit here and expect to have a democracy if I don't participate in it. I can't just be a consumer and a taxpayer. I have to be a citizen. And out of that came this um, very um, long and, and um, uh, hard-working effort to uh, force the government to give some kind of reckoning, some kind of accounting of what uh, were the, the decisions and missteps that led up to 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, and they were a very important force in the creation of the 9-11 Commission. Right. These are women who should be honored for their patriotic service to the country. And instead, um, the more they pushed, the more they were pushed back. Um, uh, legislators and the, uh, the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee in Congress at the time told them, 
You know, basically to uh, you know, pipe down and trust the government. Mm -hmm. um, the conservative media called them every name in the book, you know, hysterics, rock stars of grief. Um, uh, and they were uh, accused of, an, of falsely of taking money from uh, Democratic coffers, of, of um, accepting funds from the Theresa Hines uh, uh, Family Foundation, all untrue. Um, as, and ultimately they uh, wound up very disillusioned about uh, the ability to to as uh, as uh, Kristen Breitweiser, one of them said, you know, the ability of the country to confront the truth about anything. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who say oh. to you, look, you're ignoring these very strong women who came to the fore well, after that time? Well, I say several things. Um, first of all, everyone always brings up the same four women, which right. makes, <laughs> right. you know, are we really going to satisfy, be satisfied with four women in, in, in a massive country? Right. Well, they're um, also presidents of universities and such, right. I suppose. But what but, do you say? But putting that aside, um, my point in this book is not uh, that 9-11 set women back. Uh -huh. um, I, uh, it's not about, the book is not about what 9-11 did to women or to men for that matter. It's what 9-11 revealed about us as a nation yeah, because uh, what happened after 9-11 was, it was almost as if the, um, you know, the wrapper was, the, the plaster was cracked and we could see into our own uh, deepest anxieties and vulnerabilities and fears and see the, the, the cultural machinery by which we manage that, by which we cover it up with this mythology. And the mythology came to the fore mm -hmm. and was visible. But that's not to say that mythology uh, was only present in 9-11. It was just we could see it better. Mm -hmm. um, the mythology is always there. I mean, all my life I've seen women um, uh, make great strides only to hit up against this invisible wall of resistance. And that wall, that force, is this myth we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, as far as Hillary Clinton, uh, she is not uh, a phenomenon of 9-11. I mean, her, in fact, um, quite the contrary, I would say that the fact that she um, is now the front runner all these years since 9-11 has a lot to do with uh, the American electorate um, slowly but surely beginning to wake up to the fact that this go-it-alone cowboy ethic uh, is not doing us any good, has gotten us into greater peril, has not made the nation any safer. Um, I, you know, so, so you could argue that that uh, Hillary Clinton, who herself said in uh, at a rally in California the other day, if I'm elected, I will put an end to cowboy diplomacy. Um, that her part of her appeal is uh, that she's she's not playing this card, and that that people are are beginning to see um, where this led us. This led us to. Um, uh, uh, the erosion of civil liberties to government endorsements of torture to to uh, entering a war against the people who hadn't attacked us and crippling our fight against those who did. With the history of the Louisiana Territory or the gold rush, um, black men, Indians, um, yeah, uh, uh, the dark man was very much in our midst and the dark races very much in our midst, but it's very much demonized. Mm. Um, Tell and us about that. So, well, for example, uh, look at, I mean, another uh, iteration of how this uh, myth played out uh, was after the Civil War, with the, um, here, the defeated South, humiliated at, you know, not being able to protect uh, their land from, and their families uh, from, from Yankee incursion. Uh, restored their honor with uh, uh, this uh, rescue fantasy drama um, of a, a lynching black freedmen who they uh, you know, claimed were falsely uh, had, were engaged in an epidemic um, uh, campaign of rape against uh, you know the white uh, virginal southern woman. Uh, uh, earlier in the early, at the 
uh, early 1800s, late 1700s, uh, there was a, a whole drama around the, the um, Barbary Coast uh, captivity. Uh, and what was actually happening were uh, largely, almost entirely, uh, men, uh, uh, American merchants uh, who, uh, and sailors who uh, were taken captive uh, while you know, out engaged in trade and, and military forays. Um, and uh, no less a luminary than uh, a Puritan luminary than Cotton Mather um, talked about how this was the greatest, uh, the, the, you know, Muslim attack was the greatest terrorist uh, threat to, uh, there was none other that was, that was a more horrifying or barbaric captivity. Uh, and again, the story, since it was mostly men who were taken uh, captive, the story was rewritten um, in, in uh, uh, fictional accounts that were presented as nonfiction at the time and became bestsellers told of uh, women who had been taken captive in the Barbary Coast and valiant male uh, American sailors who had come to their rescue. In one case, a, a male account of his captivity was basically lifted um, whole cloth, and just the pronouns were changed, and it became, you know, the terrible suffering of, of um, you know, some young, uh, young thing. Mm -hmm. What What do you say to those of us who are, um, you know, sort of, perhaps even marginal in the in the uh, sort of the American? culture, that those of us who are new to, to America, new to the myth, what do you say to us about this, about this myth? Well, you know, I mean, my father grew up in Hungary, um, you know, we all are only a few steps right. away from, right. from an, belonging to another culture. Right. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, and some of us don't even enjoy westerns or don't, you know, care about football. But yet, we all swim in these waters, and it's uh, increasingly hard to uh, to not because it's the commercial culture is surround sound. It's it's everywhere, and whether you, uh, you know, I'm not talking about individual behavior. I'm talking about a cultural mindset right. that you have to even if you. Uh, I dislike it intensely, even if you have no um, feel for it at all. It's it's there. It's present 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. um, and it um, shapes the way you look at the world and you look at your country. Well, it certainly is a very powerful thesis um, that made that in the fire of this day, 9/11, when the airplanes hit and the buildings began to crumble and um, the people were jumping from windows, and they could do nothing but jump from windows. Um, we were a nation of victims, and yet we turned the story, the media turned the story, the whole culture turned the story, and labored mightily to make us the victims into heroes. And, and everything else, gender accomplishment and history, became secondary to that, re that driving narrative. Mm -hmm. um, this is therapeutic fiction, mm -hmm. is it not? And, and look at what our real experience was. For most people in America, it was watching it on TV and not being able to do anything, and which uh, all of us felt the, the agony of that, of right. seeing you know, these terrible, um, you know, catastrophic um, uh, scenes and, and being completely helpless. And, and I think our creation of, and this is why we reached for this heroic myth, to, to console ourselves, to, uh, I think it was either Time or Newsweek said, you know, what, or have we become, you know, a nation that just watches? I mean, have we become a nation of Chauncey Gardeners? And that, that um, shame at our own passivity um, and then in the days ahead, our inability to do anything else other than in um, Bush's immortal words that we should help by going out and shopping. Right. Um, I only uh, you know, underscored uh, the, the kind of uh, weakness uh, one feels and helplessness one feels in um, a culture that has only become more passive with the rise of a, um, a consumer mindset. Right. I've been talking to Susan Faludi, 
The book is The Terror Dream, published by Metropolitan Books. Thank you so much, Susan. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much.